Hi, my name is Emily Imhoff, and I am the Zoology Collections Manager at Cincinnati Museum Center. Today, I'm going to be doing this live question event. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do at the museum, and I'll be answering some questions that people send in ahead of time. And if you want to ask a question during the event, it will pop up on my screen and I can answer it for you. So let's get started. Um, my job at the museum is kind of varied. I do a lot of different tasks, but basically it's to take care of all of the zoology collections. So the zoology collections includes organisms from lots of different groups. So we've got birds, mammals, insects, spiders, uh, aquatic animals like fish, crayfish. We've got frogs, toads, um, freshwater mussels. All kinds of different animals are all included under zoology. Um, so we, we don't cover plants, so that would be botany, um, but all different animals. So you can ask me questions about all those different areas, what kind of specimens we have, um, how we take care of them, things like that. So I'm going to get started with some of these pre-asked questions. Stanley here is helping me out. Thank you, Stanley. OK. First question, what criteria is used to select items in the collection from Sherry? All right, Sherry, so um, we are offered collection items from the public or from other institutions. And uh, one of our criteria, of course, is does this item have data with it? So. Um, most of our collection is used for research purposes, and it's only valuable for research, really, if you have data with it. So where was this animal collected, and when was it collected there? And that provides a record for the future, saying this animal was collected at this location at this time. Um, so that's very informative for future researchers. Um, so if it has data, we're much more inclined to select it for the collection. If it doesn't have data, we may still accept it if it is something we don't have in the collection yet, or if it's just a really good example of the species, or if we really need that item for a, a display we're doing, or maybe for educational purposes. Okay, let's try another question here. What is a pangolin? Ah, so a pangolin, you might have heard about them in the news. They are also called spiny anteaters, and they are um, an animal about this size, um, kind of the same size as a bread box, <laughs> and they are covered with scales. They almost look like a pine cone. They're covered with scales that are made out of keratin, which is the same thing as your fingernails. So these scales help protect them against predators, um, they can actually roll up in a little ball and cover themselves with their scales. So they are a mammal, so they're from the same group as people and dogs and cats and everything. Um, they're not really fluffy, though. They're just covered with those scales. Let's see, they are um, insectivores, so they eat insects. They are a spiny anteater, after all. And you can find them in southern Asia and also in Africa. I think there's several different species. Um, we do have some of them in our collections. We've got, I think, three mounted pangolins. They're quite old specimens, but they're in really good shape. And one of them is actually on display. So when we reopen, you can go and see the pangolin and see what it looks like. All right. What is the difference between a taxidermy mount and a study skin? Okay, that's a good question. So in our collections, we have a lot of animals that are done as study skins rather than taxidermy. So a taxidermy is what you think of when you think of um, a, a trophy buck mounted on the wall um, or like a mounted coyote or a wolf where it looks like the animal is alive. Um, and that's where the word taxidermy comes from. But study skins are... A little different. So here's a study skin of an English house sparrow, which is an invasive species here in the U.S. So you can see it doesn't look like it's alive at all. It's it's flat. It's been prepared to lay flat. And if you see by its size, you could you can put a lot of these into a drawer, and they'll nestle up against each other just like sardines. 
So a study skin doesn't take as much expertise or time to manufacture. Um, they're a lot faster and uh, not as detailed. They also take up less space so you can fit more of them in the collection. And with our study skins lately, we have been actually preparing a wing separately. So this is called a spread wing, where you uh, take the wing, spread it out, and it's dried like this. And this is so researchers can look at the feathers and the molt pattern on the wing and look at it that way. Because in your regular study skin where both the wings are together, they are, um, you can't really study the wings anymore because they're dried together. Okay, let's see another question. How many crawfish species are there in Ohio and in northern Kentucky? Okay, so I probably failed to mention this, but my area of expertise is um, freshwater biology or freshwater ecology, and my specialty is crayfish. So the crayfish question is perfect. Send me all your crayfish questions. All right, so Ohio has about 20 different crayfish species, give or take one or two. Um, those are uh, native species, and there's an introduced species as well, the red swamp crayfish. So um, a bit about the name crawfish versus crayfish. Crayfish is the kind of true name for the group of organisms. Crawfish and crawdad are kind of colloquialisms. However, um, there are some official common names of crayfish that do have crawfish in it, like the red swamp crawfish. Um, okay, so northern Kentucky. Um, Kentucky has more crayfish species than Ohio. Uh, they have about 50 crayfish, whereas Ohio has about 20. But northern Kentucky, the three counties at the top, have mm, about five or six different species. And that includes crayfish you would find um, in streams and rivers, and also crayfish that are called burrowers, and they live um, in those tunnels. You might see their chimneys up in your yard or in a, a grassy area, see those mud chimneys come up. Those are burrowing crayfish. So there's uh, two or three species of each of those in northern Kentucky. Um, so southeast United States is actually the crayfish biodiversity hotspot in the entire world. Um, there can be like 80 species in uh, one of the states down there. Um, and then as you radiate out from there, you have fewer species. So it's also a hot spot for freshwater mussels and fish species. Okay, next question. Thank you, Stanley. We've got a couple of questions here from the same person. Okay. Does Dr. Emily have a favorite specimen at the museum from Riva? Uh, it's really hard to pick a favorite when you can go in and see just dozens of species arranged all together. Um, my favorite specimens are just opening a drawer and seeing all the different birds, probably. Uh, let's see, if I had to pick absolute favorite, there is a adorable little tiny quail that was a captive specimen from earlier in the century. And uh, it's a Chinese painted quail. And we also have a really beautiful Arctic fox specimen that we've had for some time. And we have some, um, some uh, birds from our exhibit where we used to have a um, extinct bird on display, the great auk. Um, was on display at our old Gilbert Avenue Museum, and all the birds from that display are just beautifully taxidermied. I always smile when I open up their cabinet and see them. Okay. Is there a specimen she would love to see in the collection that is not there currently? Well, as a crayfish scientist, of course I would like to see all of the Ohio crayfish species represented, but we do not currently have them all, so I'm working on getting those. <laughs> oh, we've got some more questions popping up here. I didn't see them. Okay, we're going to answer these. Okay, what is a mud bug? Okay, a mud bug is another name for a crayfish. Um, usually it refers to those burrowing crayfish that you see out in your yard um, because they do live down in their mud tunnels. 
and they will come up at night when it is damp and cruise around. So you might be lucky to spot a mud bug. And again, it's like a colloquialism um, or a slang term, mud bug, but it is in some of the official common names. So we've got the painted hand mud bug around here. Okay, um, Bob says, why is it important to have multiple examples of the same species in your collection? I.e., why do we have so many cardinals? That is a great question, Bob. So why would you want to have lots and lots of common specimens in your collection? And the answer is back to why we have the collection in the first place. Um, one of the main reasons is for research. So researchers will often want to look at many individuals of the same species to compare them and see what is the natural variation in this species. Um, also, studies where you look at things like changes in the species over time, um, that kind of thing. So there was a study done looking at air pollution, and they looked at um, deposits on the bird study skins, basically, and they used a lot of the same species over time to see how it compared, because that same species is going to be using the same habitats, um, so you can compare how that changed over time. All right, another question. What's that beeping in the background? <laughs> the beeping in the background is my pet birds. They are not baby chicks. They are adults. They're just um, finches that I have as pets. But they're pretty loud. I can't really do anything about it. Okay, and another question. What special powers do crayfish have, and should we be worried? Thank you, Tyler. Crayfish do have a special power, actually, that we don't, which is the power of regeneration. If a crayfish loses a limb or its antennae or a claw, um, it can actually grow that limb back. So when they grow, instead of growing like us, where they just slowly get larger over time um, and then reach an adult stage, they grow pretty much their whole lives, although they do slow down as they get older. But they molt. They shed their hard exoskeleton, and then they grow a little bit, and then they harden again. So when they're shedding, they are actually able to kind of grow that new leg back. As they go through a couple of sheds, they will have a whole new leg. So they, as their surgical power, you shouldn't be worried about it though. All right, let's see another question. See if we've got anyone popping up here. Nothing new popping up, okay. What does a typical day at the museum look like for you? From Jacqueline. Well, Jacqueline, a typical day could be anything. It's very, um, very varied activities take place. So um, Wednesdays, I could be skinning a bird. Then the next day, I might be helping to plan a new exhibit. So right now, we're working on planning the Ice Age exhibit. So we're doing lots of research for that, um, preparing specimens, things like that. Um, I also do a lot of databasing, so working with spreadsheets. We're trying to transfer all of our old paper catalogs into uh, digital spreadsheets so that we can put them online and researchers can access them from around the world and find out what we have that they might want to use. <laughs> um, other things, working with volunteers. Sometimes I help take care of the live animals over at the terminal or even do educational programs over there. Um, and of course, we have a genetics lab. Uh, if you've been to the terminal and seen that. So sometimes I do research in that lab, either my own projects or helping with projects from some of our collaborators. Oh, we have a question. Do crayfish harbor parasites? Yes, crayfish can have a, um, a lot of different parasites. They have some that live on their bodies and don't really cause them too much harm. Um, we have some that can live inside of them. And there is one actually that can be harmful to humans. So um, this is Paragonimus kilicati, and it's only a concern if you're eating crayfish that are raw and alive, basically. So don't eat live raw crayfish. You'll be fine. Uh, I have eaten many boiled crayfish and been just fine. So there's no need to worry about them if you cook them. Okay, what is my favorite part of my job? Oh my goodness, um, definitely the chance to learn about all these different organisms. So like I said, I specialize in um, aquatic animals and especially in crayfish um, and a bit of freshwater mussels. So learning about all these additional animals that we have um, has been really, really educational and fun. So I just love it. While we're waiting for more questions to pop up, we've got some more 
pre-asked questions. Are there any surprising items in the collection? Oh yes, there are some really interesting things that I have found in there. Um, so when I started, we were actually getting a new cabinet tree. So one of the first things that I did was move almost every item that we have out of the old cabinetry and into the new cabinetry, which is much more secure for it. So I found some weird things. Um, one of which is called a mad stone, which is actually a little, um, like a little mineral deposit. It's about the size of a quarter, but about that thick. And it's a concretion of minerals found from a deer stomach. And it was harvested from a deer somewhere west of the Mississippi. I don't remember exactly where, um, but these were, believed to be almost magical items um, back in the historical times, probably like pre-1900s. And if you were bitten by a rabid dog or a mad dog or a dog that might have been rabid, um, you would take a train or ride a horse for days, whatever it took to get to somewhere that had a mad stone. And the person who had the mad stone, they would treat it with like milk and stick it to your bite and it would stick to there, and then when it fell off, supposedly it had pulled out the rabies or whatever else you might be infected with. So uh, we actually have this one that was purchased by someone in Cincinnati and was known as the Cincinnati Madstone. So we found that in the collection and it's in a really old box with the old lettering saying Madstone. It's really interesting. Uh, we also have a Cyclops calf. So there's a birth defect that's more common in sheep, but it can be found in cows, where the calf is born with a single eye socket right in the center of its head, and then the upper jaw is basically reduced. So instead of having a, a calf with a face like this, it's just like mushed together. So um, obviously they can't survive like this. Um, so it is a very, very small skull from a newborn calf, basically, but it's got the single eye socket. It's really interesting. Okay, we got another crayfish question. What is your favorite species of crayfish and why? Oh my goodness. Well, around here, oh, someone says like a bezoar. Yeah, yeah, a madstone is basically also called a bezoar. But for deer, yeah. Um, what is my favorite species of crayfish? Um, I really like the digger crayfish, Phyllocambarus photians, and they have a very strange distribution pattern. I have yet to find one in our region, but they could be here, so. Fingers crossed, we'll find one. Um, but another cool species that we don't have around here is the giant Tasmanian freshwater lobster, which can grow up to a meter in length, which is like a huge, huge crayfish. And they come out of the streams at night sometimes and they cruise around on the forest floor. So just imagine encountering a meter long black crayfish in the night. Awesome. Someday maybe I'll see one. Okay. Let's see, another question here. Do you think birds think they're better than us? <laughs> Do birds think they're better than us? They probably don't have that complex of a thought, but I will say they definitely seem to ignore people completely until you get within their, their flight zone. So, you know, they're, what are we on our two legs? We can't even fly, we're probably nothing to them. But uh, they probably don't think that hard about it. They just, you know, if we get close, they worry about us. If we don't get close, they probably don't think about us. All right. How many live animals does the museum have, and who is your favorite? Okay, the museum has over 30 different species of live animals right now. Um, and that includes um, reptiles, amphibians, fish, insects, spiders. I think that's about it. Um, so some of these live out on the museum floor. You've probably seen them in the Children's Museum or in the cave area. We have uh, live animals on display. But we also have a lot of live animals that live behind the scenes, and they come out for programs. So They'll come out if we're doing our daily um, animal touch experience or if we are going out to a um, classroom out in a school or a boy scout group a girl scout group something like that and um, we have those animals available for those so so all the bats live most of the bats live behind the scenes for example um, my favorite has got to be the snakes but it's so hard to pick just one um let's see chicken the 
guidebooks here. Got the bookcase right by. It's convenient. So we have some rat snakes. Um, we have a rat snake that is called a corn snake, and her name is Kellogg. She is one of my favorites. And we also have um, black rat snakes, or called gray rat snakes now. We've got Salazar and Manito. So Salazar lives up by the cave, and Manito lives behind the scenes. And probably those guys are my favorites. They seem to have nice little personalities, and they're a lot of fun to handle. Um, the bats are awesome, too. My favorite bats would probably be Marsha. She's really friendly and loves to fly during the bat flight program. And Raphael, he's one of our new ones. He's also pretty sweet. OK, we've got some more questions. Um, what are some of the oldest specimens in your collection? Uh, we have some uh, shells, some freshwater snail shells that were collected um, by Thomas Say a long time ago. I'm not sure on the exact dates of those since I don't have them in front of me. Um, we also have some very old bird specimens from the early 1800s and mid 1800s. So those are those on the shelves would be some of our oldest ones. Okay, what would be your dream zoology exhibit? Huh. Well, I have been thinking it would be fun to do an exhibit of all of the um, state animals of the United States, especially the state birds, um, to show what they all look like. Most people know their own state bird. Ours is the cardinal in Ohio. We know what it looks like, but um, we may not be familiar with all the other state birds across the U.S. I think it would be a fun little learning activity. Okay, got a lot more questions to get through here. Whew. When Dr. Emily is not collecting specimens, does she interact with museum guests? If so, what is her favorite show she gets to host, or what does she recommend as a must-see at the museum? So most of the time, I am working behind the scenes um, or off-site. Um, so I don't interact with museum guests a whole lot, but I do fill in for the live animal programs sometimes. So you might see me doing the bat flight program, or bats up close rather, or the animals up close program, where we bring out a snake or a turtle or um, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches and let people look at them and learn about them. So those are pretty fun. I like doing those. But um, I recently developed a little program for outside of our genetics lab um, about DNA barcoding. Um, and we did that during the STEM day for kids a couple months ago. And that was a lot of fun. And the kids seemed to really enjoy it. So I'm hoping I get to do that one some more. Um, as far as a must at the museum, going to have to go with the cave. It's got animals and it's got a lot of um, really cool uh, scenery. When you go inside the cave, you'll feel like you're really in a cave. So that is probably my must-see at the museum. Also, the new dinosaur is pretty awesome, you have to admit. Okay, how long ago was the oldest collection in your museum made? What does it tell us about the past and the future from Roger? Um, so we talked a little bit about what some of our older specimens were. Um, I'm going to say those older bird specimens. Uh, they were collected, a lot of them are these beautiful little warbler species, um, migratory birds. And they were collected, there were no regulations um, about collecting birds for um, decorations, for just putting them in your house, for museums, for decorating hats, whatever. Um, and some of these birds became overhunted. Um, especially down in Florida. And we now have the Migratory Bird Act, which um, helps control the uh, harvesting of these birds that are not, not game birds. So um, I guess what it tells us about the past is that in the past, people could just go out and collect whatever they wanted, just shoot the bird, stuff the bird, have it in your house for your own amusement or, or whatever. Um, and uh, now, obviously, we don't do that. Most of our birds we get now are um, birds that have flown into people's windows, and they die, and, and the homeowner finds them and um, offers them to us. We also get some roadkill. But um, we don't go out and um, harvest uh, or kill birds anymore or other animals. Um, we just rely on ones that have already been killed, basically. So uh, as for the future, um, most of these bird populations are declining right now, actually, so uh, if anything, we'd probably have even more strict regulations on collecting them and keeping them. Okay, another question. If you have fish skeletons, what is your favorite? Oh, we don't have many fish skeletons. All of our fish um, are preserved whole in alcohol, so they're, 
uh, dead things in jars. Um, so you can't really see the skeleton. We do have one fish skeleton that was for an exhibit, and that was a perch. So I guess by default, that would be my favorite because it's the only one we have. Um, instead, I'm just going to say my favorite fish specimen, which is a um, alligator gar specimen. It's very old. We don't have any data on where the museum got it or how long we've had it. Obviously, over 100 years. <clears throat> it's super old. But uh, it's a really impressive specimen. It's uh, four feet plus long and just awesome to look at. Okay, let's see. We've got a few minutes left. Let's try to get through the rest of these. What is the strangest thing found inside a specimen from Lauren? Okay, Lauren, this is going to get gross. So if you don't want to hear something gross, just don't listen for the next few seconds. Um, when we're preparing the bird specimens, we do a necropsy, um, also with mammals, any time we're preparing them. So we're, we're basically gutting them and taking all the entrails out. So um, sometimes we find parasites in there. So we have found um, some like the larvae in there and also like large roundworm infestations. So that's the kind of surprising thing you find inside a specimen. Okay, if the mayor of Cincinnati came to visit the collection and you, what one message would you like them to remember? Um, so usually when we have someone visit the collection for the first time, they walk in and they're just overawed by all the different species we have, all the different mounts and skeletons, and they just think, wow, this is amazing, you know, we need to take care of this. So I think that that sense of awe is really the most important thing to go away from the collection with. <laughs> is there something you wish you could have in the collection but currently don't? Um, like I said, we don't have all of Ohio's crayfish species yet. Um, so I would like to finish that collection and get them all in there so we can have them for comparison. Um, so when I'm doing crayfish research, I can use them to um, basically be uh, voucher specimens. Okay, we got another question pop up. Olivia would like to know how the beetles are. Ah, so um, the beetles she's asking about are actually our dermestid beetles. Uh, dermestid beetles are um, beetles that eat flesh. So um, they're the ones who are eating roadkill or things that die in the woods. They're going to be eating those. Um, and we actually keep a colony of these beetles at our uh, collections facility outside of the building. They have their own shed because we don't want these flesh eating beetles to get into the collection because they could um, damage it. So they live outside and we, once we have skinned the animal and prepared the study skin, we have the bones we want to be cleaned and we put the bones into the beetle shed and then they eat all the flesh off of them and basically clean them for us. Um, so we don't have any right now because it is winter um, and they don't survive over the winter. Um, so the beetles are not no longer with us right now. Um, we may or may not get some this summer. Um, we don't have a whole lot of larger items that need to be cleaned, so we'll see. If you're lucky, we'll be allowed to post some uh, graphic photos and videos of the beetles working on um, some uh, skeletons. Okay, Roger has another question. Have you ever seen a hair lip sucker specimen? I do not think that I have seen one in person, unfortunately. That is a rare fish species. Okay, we've got our last pre-asked question here from Stanley. Thank you, Stanley, for your help. Um, what in the collection does Dr. Emily consider to be the most interesting, rare, or educational? Hmm. Um, let's see, educational. We do have education collections, which are the items that usually don't have data. So that's what we usually use for education. And we have a, a wide variety of birds in that collection. Um, one of our most widely used collections actually is the freshwater mussels, though. We have a very good collection of freshwater mussels. Um, they're nicely arranged, they're identified, and we have several local um, freshwater mussel experts and even people who've come from farther away to come and use that collection. So that's probably one of our most um, valuable ones. Um, let's see, rare? Okay, uh, probably our most rare item is our great ox specimen. So this was purchased by the museum in the 70s. But the specimen itself is from, like, 
1840s or before, because that's when they went extinct. So it's very rare to have one of these birds, especially in the United States. Um, we're actually having some research done on our specimen right now, which um, I think you'll be able to read about in a blog post coming up pretty soon about some of the uh, work being done with a, a university in Europe to find out more about the origins of our actual specimen. So we're not 100% sure where and when it was harvested. Okay, let's see. It looks like we are right at 1130. So I am supposed to close now. And there's no more questions. So perfect timing. Great. Hopefully I'll be able to do this again sometime and answer um, more questions that you might have. It was a lot of fun. So thank you for joining me. If you want to see more activities, um, read blog posts and see more videos, um, including some cool activities you can do with your kids, um, you can visit our website at cincymuseum.org. That's Cincy with a Y. Um, you can also follow us on social media on multiple platforms. We've got Facebook, um, Instagram, I think there's Twitter as well. Um, so we can't wait to see you back at the terminal once we reopen and you can check out some of these cool items I've been talking about. Um, now we are a nonprofit, so we are um, usually relying on ticket sales to operate. And of course we can't do that now. So if you enjoyed this video and if you'd like to make a donation, um, that would be wonderful, and you can do so on our website at cincymuseum.org. So thank you again for tuning in, and I hope you learned something and had a good time. And we'll look forward to next week for another Facebook Live with the Curator event. Thanks, and have a nice day.